Merhaba Şerpa Blok takipçileri. Brand Week etkinliğinde sahne alacak ünlü isimlerle bir araya gelmeye devam ediyoruz. Şimdiki konuğumuz Luke Williams. Welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, let's start with our first question. Um, you are the head of customer experience at Qualtrics and the author of two magnificent books, um, The Wallet Allocation Rule and Why Loyalty Matters. As a thought leader, what steps do you think companies and brands should follow to survive in the era of artificial intelligence, augmented reality and virtual reality? Yeah, this is uh, this is a great question. It's one that we get a lot. I think the infiltration of technology into how businesses run, uh, I think we're, we're seeing that hit full steam now and I think is inevitable for any business in the future. Um, I think one of the things we're focusing on at the moment uh, is something that we call a programmable technology layer. And essentially what that is, Um, is a technology that you can acquire and then you can customize it uniquely to your business. So that technology can help you compete in the ways that your company wants to compete, not just how the technology wants to function. So I think one of the things that we're seeing at the moment is the combination uh, of experience data with operational data. Companies used to have a lot of operational data. They didn't have as much experience data. Um, operational data tells people uh, you know, what it is that the customer did, but not necessarily why they did it. So now we're starting to see those two things come together. And artificial intelligence just expedites the speed at which we can generate insights from those two sources of data. And then from an AR and VR standpoint, I think particularly disruptive in the retail space, but also in places like automotive, for example, uh, where you can imagine 10 years from now, shopping for a car, uh, everyone will have an AR, VR type of adaptable technology that ultimately uh, they can experience something from a remote location and can ultimately change the retail experience. I think the summary of that is uh, that companies should be expecting technology to change the way that their businesses operate. And I think companies should spend a lot of time testing those technologies to make sure that they're finding the right way uh, to compete in the future for themselves. Uh, what is wallet allocation rule? And uh, why do you think the book has changed the game? Uh, the wallet allocation rule uh, was, an, was, a mis was a mistake. It was an accident. Uh, we started doing some R&D, uh, myself, uh, two other authors, uh, Dr. Tim Kiningham at St. John's University, uh, and Dr. Lerzan Aksoy, uh, who's at Fordham University. She actually taught here in Istanbul at Coach University for a number of years. Um, we were searching for an understanding of how customers attach to brands. We were searching for that uh, understanding customer loyalty better. And we stumbled upon, uh, along with Alexander Buey, uh, who's our partner in crime, Um, we discovered um, the wallet allocation rule, a mathematical formula by accident, essentially that explains uh, how it is that customers spend money, right? Um, it used to be believed that customer, increasing customer satisfaction would increase people's spend. Largely, the data doesn't support that. What we discovered was um, that there are actually two primary drivers of what force people to spend money. Um, and the wallet allocation rule essentially uh, was... Uh, the subject of a Harvard Business Review article and a number of scientific journal articles. Um, we just got lucky. Uh, and the way that it's changing the business is it forces people, and when they're running their companies, to think about their company the way that customers do, right? When we think about our customer, if you're my customer, I think you're my customer. But if you shop with me and two of my competitors, you're not my customer, you're everybody's customer. And forcing people to think in a competitive way just realign people to basic business principles of don't just think about yourself, don't just think about how the customer is benefiting you, think about the choices that a customer makes and ultimately enhance the customer experience so that they will choose you more often. Uh, why do well-performing companies decide on radically rebranding? Well, there's a couple of things actually that are in my, in my speech today. Um, there are some really... Um, bad performing companies that essentially they, they pick up this, this negative aura around them and they're not performing well financially. And typically when you see when customers are unhappy and the customer or, or the, the brand is performing poorly, uh, rebranding is an opportunity to reset the customer mindset, right? To separate the customer's attachment to a symbol from the bad experiences that they've had. Now, that being said, There's a number of companies that do extraordinarily well that deliver poorly on customer experience. We see this, uh, the best customer experiences are often um, from the smallest brands, 
right? A niche brand, your local neighborhood store that understands its, its local demographic extraordinarily well, but doesn't know necessarily how to scale that business. Um, there's a paradox there where the larger that you get, the actually less satisfied your customers can become. So it's essential to be listening to your customers uh, at all times to inform uh, how it is that we make decisions about the products we offer, the customer experience that we want to deliver, and how we're making sure to hire the right employees so that we're delivering on these brand promises. Because if you don't, you'll be in a very bad situation where rebranding or bankruptcy may be your only two options. Your speech today will be about five customer experience myths uh, that kill brands. Can you tell us a bit about your session? Um, what kind of impact do you expect to leave on the audience today? Ah, uh, um, well, let's be honest. I'm a researcher, right? So I will come and I will present um, facts and figures from scientific data and how people receive that. Uh, you hope they receive it well. We'll ask them to be open-minded. Um, I give the example in my speech um, that Galileo, right, is a prime example of somebody who gave scientific evidence for his theory of heliocentricity. Now, the stuff that we talk about isn't nearly as big as all that, but what you found was um, presenting uh, myths, right, and explaining how myths occur uh, can have really negative effects on the person who's explaining them. So uh, we'll try to present evidence and case studies um, for the typical things that we believe in and also let people know that it's okay that they believe in myths to a certain extent. There are really three reasons people believe in myths. And one of those reasons is part of the myth is usually true, right? So people aren't silly or stupid for believing in myths. Um, they just haven't studied enough of the data to realize that it's a problem. And to this point, most companies are not disrupted by myths because everybody believes the same myth. So one of the points of the speech today is that that's okay until someone figures out that the myth isn't true and then engineers an advantage uh, over the people who believe the myth uh, still exists. So uh, when we're talking about customer experience and driving your business, the end of the story is listen to your customers more deeply, understand data more thoroughly, react to customers more quickly, uh, and ultimately do this um, with, a, with a better uh, heart as a company. Uh, and ultimately, that helps brands survive. Our final question, actually. Uh, what would be the one and only suggestion that you would make from where you see our future uh, to the young professionals who aim to make different if difference, create some change uh, in the fields of design, software, and technology? Uh, in those fields, I think there's two sides of the world. There's going to be the very hardcore operational business side, right? People who have finance degrees or operational management degrees, people going into the creative agencies don't typically have those kinds of backgrounds. Uh, they tend to see the world in a different way. And I think the advice that I would give to both parties is to make sure that you understand the others uh, completely, right? Just because you're in the creative side doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't understand how a business runs. That's absolutely essential to delivering the best value back to the business. And from the operational standpoint, uh, you can have the best operations on the planet and have no brand, right? You can have a, a you know, a vending machine is a perfect, a perfect example of a thing that works perfectly but has absolutely no brand, right? So you really need to be able to understand where your counterpart is coming from and to work together. Um, and I think in an era where people are starting to specialize much earlier, people are, are, you know, with access to the internet and information, people are choosing life paths earlier. They're getting interested in the things they're interested in much earlier. They're doing fewer things as a result. Uh, I would encourage people to stay open-minded. Uh, the human brain was designed to absorb a lot of information and synthesize it. Don't, don't cheat your brain from having the right information. Uh, be open, keep reading, keep studying, never stop. Um, and ultimately, if you keep doing that, if you're a student uh, at life, I guess, um, you'll find you're going to get much better outcomes for the brand and personally. You're going to get much better personal fulfillment uh, from your career as a result. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for I'm having me. I'm glad to uh, have you on Sharp Thank you Thank for you. having me. Bir sonraki röportajımızda görüşmek üzere, hoşçakalın.